Um, now we are going to transition into our first session, and I am very happy and proud to see uh, two wonderful deans of the schools of businesses at uh, UNC and at North Carolina Central, and um, Jordan Martin, who is a marketing major, she's a junior from North Carolina Central, will be taking us into a riveting uh, fireside chat with Dean Doug Shackelford and Dean Anthony Nelson. Jordan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for that nice welcoming, Ms. Williams. As you all know, my name is Jordan Martin and I am a senior here at NCCU. And I am a marketing major and a mass comm major. And today I will be facilitating the fireside chat between the two deans between the School of Businesses before Keenan Flagner and NCCU. I'll start by asking the first question to Dean Shackelford and then I'll ask the same exact question to Dean Nelson. What is the response and subsequent actions amongst your respective institutions regarding issues surrounding race, racism, and last year's social unrest? Well, let me just start, Jordan, by thanking you and, and all the students at both uh, Central and, and uh, here at Carolina for putting this on. I, um, as I've thought about this, I've um, I've imagined myself when I was an undergraduate at Carolina and thought, I don't think I would have been any part of being able to put something like this on. So congrats to all of you. And it's a, uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to join with uh, Dean Nelson to, to be able to do this today. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, with regards to your question, uh, you know, we have been thinking about this kind of issue and moving on this kind of issue, but when uh, the George Floyd murder occurred last summer, it was like a rocket shot uh, in our community. And I think that um, uh, as horrible as his death and the, um, not, you know, not just his death, but just a series of horrible deaths that have come before and unfortunately come after, um, it was a moment of awakening and a moment of it's time for us to take things more seriously and move on things that we've been talking about. So a lot of things have happened in the business school since then. I would really put it in two categories. One is representation issues. The other one I would put in the category of inclusion and belonging. And I'll talk a little bit about both of them. I, I will say on the, on the representation front, uh, we're struggling. I think we're making better ground on the inclusion and belonging front. Uh, we're trying and we're doing a lot of things. Um, the, in some sense, uh, we will see how these things matter down the road though. Um, so let me, let me just share a few things. Um, we conducted climate surveys of both our faculty and staff. We've added DEI prompt questions to course evaluations for all of our classes. We've had uh, required faculty training um, for all of our faculty on how we make our classrooms more inclusive. We now have required courses, both at the graduate level, well, at the MBA level, and then at the undergraduate level, we're basically trying to infuse into all of our core courses, different issues on inclusion. Um, we, um, we changed our um, core values, which we've had five core values since the 1990s. We added inclusion as one of our core values to just elevate that and make, make it clear the importance of that. Um, as far as the representation, you know, we're, we struggled there because what we would like to do, frankly, is say, uh, we are going to have a certain percentage of our population, both at the faculty and student level to be uh, people of color. Uh, we're not able to make those sorts of statements. So we sort of have to work around how do you get to a more diverse population. We've made some, in a percentage sense, we've made rather dramatic increases in the people of color on our faculty, but we start from such a small base that the absolute number is nothing to brag about. And we still got a lot of grounds to cover there. Um, the, you know, I think if you, you asked most of the people in our community, I think they would say we're moving in the right direction, but I think that, I don't think anybody's, including myself, is satisfied with what we've, where we're at. Um, um, I think there's um, a growing, um, we're all tired of talking 
and starting initiatives. We'd like to see, you know, uh, better, clear uh, results. And uh, I don't think we're going to be satisfied until we've got more people of color, both in our student ranks, our faculty ranks. Um, as far as the making a more inclusive education, um, you know, I think we're really building our students' knowledge and understanding of what it means to have an inclusive environment. I think uh, how to be better allies, many of the things that I think you guys are focusing on today, I think we've made advances on that. Um, we started with our faculty, something we call difficult conversations. You know, I think one of the things, at least the people of my generation, I don't think it's nearly as much of people of your generation, is just let's talk about things that previously the way we deal with it is we just don't talk. Uh, we're scared, frankly, to talk because we, if we do, we don't know if someone's going to say something that's inappropriate. Um, we, have, we have made a conscious effort to increase the DEI content uh, in our courses. We're measuring that, uh, particularly in our core courses in our full-time MBA program. Um, we're tracking the uh, diversity and representation in our, our course content. Um, as I mentioned that we're measuring that in our, our, um, our evaluations. Um, and um, we're really focusing on the hiring and uh, the, in, the uh, student enrollments. Uh, we started a, a partnership with the corporate environment, the, the corporate community. We have something we call a corporate advisory board on diversity and inclusion. Uh, frankly, I thought the corporate community could tell us how to do everything. I found out they're, they're struggling with the same issues we're struggling with. So I guess if I sort of sum things up, um, this has been important to us for a long time. It is a far more active area in the last year. We still have a long ways to go. Thank you for your candor on that answer. Dean Nelson, Dean, sorry, Dean Nelson, I'm gonna ask you the same exact question. What is the response and subsequent actions amongst your respective institution regarding issues surrounding race, racism, and last year's social unrest? And I would also like to add, is your answer different because you are the Dean of a HBCU business school? Well, the let me first of all say, Jordan, um, you know, thank you for uh, moderating this panel session and, and also thank, I want to thank the student leaders for putting this together. Uh, as Dean Shackelford uh, said, um, you know, during his, when he was in school, he, he just sort of reflected on that. And I, I'd like to reflect on it as well, because uh, when I was in school, we, we certainly didn't have these uh, types of conversations. Um, and I, I want to commend the student leaders for, for uh, initiating this and, and staging it. So, uh, and I also want to thank Dean Shackelford for, for uh, his comments and, and also his, his appearance and uh, allowing us to, to talk to the students together. Um, you know, the, during well, let me address your question first. The, the, the short answer is um, yes, it is different uh, being at an HBCU um, than being at a majority school. I've been uh, fortunate to have been educated uh, both at an HBCU as well at a, at a majority school. And it's a completely uh, different environment. Um, and I've also worked at um, uh, a, a majority school as well as a, an HBCU. And again, it's a completely different environment to, to work in. So our um, students are primarily African-American. Um, our students um, live, many of them live this, uh, this in the environment of um, inequity and uh, injustice, um, and they, they come from those environments. So um, it's a different approach that, that we have. It's more of, um, okay, well, what do we do about this? And what do we, how do we uh, handle it? Uh, so when I look at um, our response, you know, I, I 
reflected back on, on what happened uh, shortly after I got to North Carolina Central University. And, and that was um, uh, the renaming of our main administration building um, where uh, the previous name was tied to or associated with an individual who had had a, a history of, of racism. And uh, the name was changed to, to the founder of, of North Carolina Central. So I, I looked at that and then, you know, the George Floyd incident came up, which, you know, I believe um, just sort of put a spotlight on the issues that, that we have in this country um, as well as, as the world. And so we, we started thinking about what can we do about the inequities and the social um, injustices. And so we, uh, one of the things we did, we had a panel session on the history of, of black entrepreneurship with um, speakers who talked about um, that evolution of how uh, blacks were denied um, access and then were able to build businesses, uh, but then they were uh, discriminated against and crimes were committed against certain communities. Uh, we had uh, Black Wall Street in Durham. We had uh, Black entrepreneurial uh, centers in, um, in Oklahoma uh, that were uh, burned to the ground. Um, and so we, we just reflected on that and then we brought the students up to speed with, okay, well, what, what has been done and what still needs to be done? Uh, and, and then we also looked at um, what, if we were to, to prioritize some areas um, where African-Americans have been denied access, what, what would they be and what would we do about it? And we, we thought about real estate and, and wealth management and, and entrepreneurship. Um, so we, we are now focusing our efforts on uh, building a real estate uh, concentration in our MBA program, a wealth management concentration, um, as well as uh, bolstering our entrepreneurship um, uh, major, as well as the a minor in that area uh, and, and uh, creating an entrepreneurship center. Uh, so we, we've begun to do that. We also don't want to create the ivory tower at North Carolina Central University and, and just make it available to those who can afford a college education. But we also want to have a societal impact as uh, Dean Shackford knows that new AACSB accreditation guidelines uh, or standards require universities to, to make uh, or to have a plan and to execute that plan as to how they will impact society. Um, and, and it's not just about diversity and inclusion, but one of our focal areas will be in, in the area of diversity and inclusion. So over the next five years, we are going to um, focus on uh, particular areas of um, social injustice and economic equality, especially in, in the um, uh, surrounding communities and, and see if we can have an impact on, on uh, those areas. You know, we've, we've also partnered with our law school. Um, they're at the beginning stages of developing a social justice uh, institute and, and we will partner with them and and uh, develop programming in the area of, um, of uh, economic uh, justice. So, uh, you know, a lot of work has to be done. I, my, I don't know about Dean Shackford, but my background is not in the area of diversity and inclusion. Um, uh, my area is in information technology, uh, but, you know, this is a very critical area um, as we prepare students to launch out into um, the, uh, 
corporate world and into society, I think that we, um, as an institution of higher education, uh, we need to prepare students to uh, make a difference and to have a very intelligent um, and knowledge-based, fact-based discussions about these tough issues and not do, as, as Dean Shackleford said, uh, just ignore the, the questions, ignore the discussion, uh, but to truly engage in it um, at, at a, in a very respectful and civil, civil manner. Thank you for that answer. It was really insightful and it makes me really excited to see what Central is going to be in the next five years. I did notice that you both tended to like just reflect a lot. I noticed that Dean Shackelford, he really focused on increasing representation and inclusion and belonging within Keenan Flagler Business School, whereas you, Dean Nelson, tended to focus on increasing generational wealth amongst the minority and the community and just include improving inclusion just among campus members. So I think that was just really interesting just to hear from that and how your different answers were. The next question for Dean Shackelford is, how does your institution prepare students for entry into diverse environments and how to confront racism in these environments? Well, I'll, I'll pick up on a point that Dean Nelson uh, was what made there. Um, I too was not trained, uh, I'm not a professional expertise in uh, these matters. But uh, I too, uh, I've come to believe that if you don't have an understanding of issues around diversity and equity and inclusion, and you're going into the business workplace, you're just as, as un unqualified as if you had no understanding of accounting or you had no understanding of finance, or no understanding of marketing or other areas. They've become that elevated and important. Um, the, uh, in our community, I would say we have two groups uh, we've got one group that they experience racism. They have experienced racism their whole life. They continue to experience it. And unfortunately, they probably will continue to experience it going forward. That group needs um, armor. They need skills. They need to be, to, to, to be able to withstand the, the effects of racism and how it, it has already affected them, how it does affect them, how it will affect them. There's another group that we need to help them understand um, how to be inclusive leaders, how to understand how that first group um, uh, is affected, and uh, how for them to be advocates and teammates. So we've got those two groups, if you will, within our community that we're, that we're trying to address um, as we try to um, help prepare our students for entry into this diverse um, labor force, as you described, which is absolutely right. You know, I, I think there's really three things that we want to do. First, it is we want to make sure everyone understands the, the value of diversity, the fact that the best organizations are going to be the organizations that have the best people. And I sometimes use this analogy. Uh, let's just say that I started a business and I said, my business is only going to have left handed people. Um, because for some reason, I believe left handed people, we're, you know, we left handed people, we're better than all the other people. So we're just gonna have left-handed people. Well, it could very well be that I'm so good at attracting left-handed talented people that I can succeed. But the likelihood is I've just told 90% of the population, you, you can't be part of my organization. And it's likely that those people who say, we'll take, we'll take people from 100% of the population are gonna dominate me in the business world. If you, if you think about the fact that none of us ended up right-handed or left-handed, except, you know, that's just how we ended up. And you apply that to all other areas of diversity, then the smart people are going to say, I'm going to take the best talent wherever it comes from. And I think we're seeing this increasingly in the corporate world. So what we need our students to recognize is the, the best organizations are going, to, are going to attract, retain, and reward the best talent. And it's going to be very diverse. To go back to my analogy, some folks are going to be left-handed and some folks are going to be right-handed. And it won't make one bit of difference as long as they're talented and 
able to, to do the task in front of them. So how do we bring together this diverse talent pool? Some left-handed, some right-handed. Now we need to know how we make it where it's an inclusive environment, where the left-handed and right-handed people all can work together, albeit the fact that they're different. And then how can we, and I go back to something I mentioned earlier, how can we have difficult conversations? Because we left-handed and we right-handed people, we are different. We can't sweep that under the rug and pretend that we're not different. No, we're, we're fundamentally different. Uh, we reach with a different hand uh, when we go to do something. So people who are gonna be able to excel in that environment, they're going to be the people who are in the organizations that prosper the most. And again, it doesn't make any difference where you come from. Those are the things that we want to make sure we do. Now, how are we doing preparing our students for that? I would like to say that from the moment of orientation until graduation, either formally in classes, informally uh, in other ways, we are trying to stress that those people who learn those principles I was just laying out are going to be more successful than those who don't. Um, and so it's a combination of some formal training. It's a lot of, of things that are just learning how to work in teams, learning how to cultivate and actually desire the diversity that brings together the various skill sets that all of us have. So those are the main things. I would add one thing. Um, I think to be successful at this, we've got to we've got to walk to walk and talk to talk and whatever that saying is. I may have gotten it backwards. I'm not positive, but uh, so we've got to have a community in our school, faculty and staff and others here that is consistent with what we're talking about. We've got to model that sort of thing. So we've got to have a an inclusive work environment here, um, and so. We are working every day to try to make sure that uh, when our students look at our faculty, when they look at our staff, when they look at our administration, they see um, an environment that um, uh, wants the best um, regardless of where it comes from, um, attracts a diverse community, rewards um, uh, that, uh, builds an inclusive environment and treats people um, uh, equitably and respectfully and, um, and leads toward a true sense of belonging. So we wanna build an, a community that uh, is indeed all the things that we're, uh, treat, we're teaching our students uh, is the successful path to take, um, not only while they're in school, but for the rest of their careers. Thank you so much, Dean Shackelford. That was just such a great answer. I really enjoyed your analogies and how you have two different groups that you're trying to prepare for. The students who are impacted by racism and those who you know benefit from it. I think that was really great that you included both groups because you can't just focus on one group. Both groups create the environment. So I'm just grateful to hear that from you. Dean Nelson, I'll be going to you for the same question. How does your institution prepare students for entry into diverse environments and confronting racism in these environments? Well, um, thanks, Jordan. Co you know, corporations have been um, better. They've, they've gotten a lot better at recruiting African-American students um, than they have um, been at retaining uh, African-Americans. Um, it, it's, it's sort of been a numbers game in the in the past where um, many corporations are saying, hey, we, we want to diversify. Uh, we want more African-Americans. Um, I've sat on many um, panel sessions with um, corporate directors. Um, one corporation wanted to diversify their entire organization. They wanted, they're the largest um, um, human uh, resources uh, firms in the in North America, um, so they were going across their entire organization, and um, they they met with directors and above to help them in the area of diversity and inclusion. So um, they they did a great job of of uh, diversifying, but they didn't do such a 
great job of, of engaging uh, all of their employees and making them feel as if they added value um, and making them feel as if they were, were really part of the, the team. Um, so there, there are a variety of reasons why they, they did, were not able to, to retain the um, uh, diverse groups of individuals that they, that they hired. Um, but I think that that, that is a, a common phenomenon that, that individuals don't feel uh, as if they are um, included within the um, major decisions. So they, uh, many uh, of our students are not familiar with the corporate environment. Uh, their parents did not work for corporations. We have a lot of first generation college students. So the, the question is how do we prepare them for a different type of environment? Um, and how do we prepare them for individuals who may not want them in that environment? How do we prepare them for, uh, to work with individuals who are insensitive and may not understand uh, what they may be going through? And how do we prepare them for individuals who um, see things happening but choose not to say anything, um, but sit on the, the, the sidelines and, and, and watch um, the uh, injustices, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, unfold? Um, so it's a, it's a matter of preparing them for a, an environment um, that sometimes is good and sometimes may not be that, that good, but we do teach them the, the skills uh, that employers are seeking, um, uh, the hard skills, uh, but then we also teach our students how to be good team members, how to work together with with others. Um, we uh, use a lot of cases in, in the classroom uh, and diversity and inclusion cases are, are very difficult to come by. So uh, many of our professors use the current events uh, to um, make sure that uh, they are staying abreast of what's going on and to introduce those, those concepts or those um, different issues into the classroom. Um, but if you look at uh, entrepreneurship, human resources, um, and, and our management courses, uh, those course those are the courses where we do engage our students in diversity and inclusion concepts. Our career readiness course, we we also engage them. We bring back um, alumni. Our alumni are are just key to. Um, helping our students uh, transition into the corporate world. The alumni take their gloves off and, and they really um, tell the students exactly uh, what they faced in, in, in the corporate world, what they are facing, and uh, that helps to prepare them. Many of our uh, uh, corporate partners have allowed our students to engage in shadow days, um, where they come in and see what it's like. Um, and if now during COVID, we're into the virtual shadow days, but still they get a chance to see what the corporate environment is, is like. Uh, but uh, I can't stress enough the importance of our alumni coming back and um, helping our students make that transition. Uh, our students, regardless of, of who you are and where, what your background is, um, you need a support group. Uh, once you, you get out there, you just can't do it alone. That's not um, what corporations are, are, are like. I mean, you have to, to work with others and there are gonna be times where you will need um, some consultation. Uh, you're gonna need someone um, to lend a, a listening ear to what uh, you are going through and what you're dealing with. Uh, you need, sometimes you may need a safe place. Uh, so uh, many of our students have been able to find that support group among alumni, um, both within their corporations and the corporations that they work for, and also 
um, uh, with them, those who work for other corporations. Uh, we've had diversity and inclusion consultants come by and speak to our students. Uh, those sessions have been riveting and uh, very um, uh, thorough and in depth uh, where they, those diversity and inclusion consultants have, have the background and the knowledge to help our students prepare for life in corporate America. Uh, one of the um, bright spots uh, across campus um, soon to be bright spots, I should say, is that our general education um, curriculum is, uh, will be revised to include um, uh, themes and learning outcomes that are associated with uh, diversity and inclusion and also global awareness. Um, so students will, will take those courses and, and have the option of participating in co-curricular activities um, that are associated with the general education curriculum um, that address diversity and, and inclusion. So I'm very excited about that. We will also uh, look at what that committee comes up with so that we can begin to adopt um, uh, uh, some of those concepts in our business curriculum. Uh, but it is very important to, to engage um, uh, our students um, and prepare our students uh, for uh, life in corporate America so that they can um, certainly make an impact uh, on that corporation and in the community. Thank you for that answer, Dean Nelson. I really enjoy how Central just really stresses community building among students and alumni. I think that's very important, just getting far in life in general. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Next, we'll take a, a question from the audience. Um, again, I'll start with Dean Shackelford with this one. The attendee wants to know, how do you view the relationship between internal inclusion, i.e. faculty and staff, and the curriculum, curriculum offerings for students? Help me a little bit with that question. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean by faculty and staff inclusion and how that relates to um, the, the curriculum. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? I believe they mean how does the diversity and inclusion like reflect with your staff, like is your staff and faculty diverse and how is that reflected in that curriculum? I believe that's what that question is asking. Okay, so as I was mentioning earlier, our faculty is not, not very diverse. Our staff is far more diverse. As far as our curriculum, um, I would say that that is an area in which we are making improvements, but we have a long ways to go. Um, so we have put, as I mentioned earlier, we've put uh, DEI material and required it in our graduate program. Um, we're, we're working it into our undergraduate curriculum. But um, this is a place in which I mentioned earlier, we've, we've required some um, training sessions for our faculty. And I think many of our majority faculty, uh, it's only dawning on them now um, that when we teach cases, and we oftentimes use Harvard cases that have been and Harvard's produced cases from forever. Um, those cases are, are based on real companies. And if you look at the leadership of, you know, the Fortune 500 companies, they're almost all led by uh, white men. So I get in front of a class and I teach about company X. Um, it's going to, by and large, the likelihood is that case is going to be led by a white man. Now, uh, later on today, we've got the CEO of Lowe's, which is a fabulous North Carolina company and is not led by a white man, but, but the exceptions are, are not nearly as often as they should be. So if I sort of followed the Harvard uh, case and I, I use the case, I, I use the example, which is going to involve the leaders of uh, corporate America today or in the recent past, uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, white men. And our faculty now are beginning to re recognize uh, that that is the historical fact. That isn't the diverse community that our students are, are likely to be part of going forward. So now we need to think about how do we 
How do we change the cases? How do we change our discussions that we're having to reflect the diverse community that is, is rapidly coming and that our students are gonna be in? But we're not there yet. Again, we are, we are moving in that direction, but uh, we're not there yet. I hope that answers the question. I think it certainly answers the question. I thank you for your honesty. Dean Nelson, I'm gonna ask you the same question. How does the inclusion and diversity amongst your staff and faculty reflect in the diversity in your curriculum? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, when you, again, we have a different environment. We have a very diverse faculty, not all African-Americans, um, but we have faculty members from Korea. We have faculty members from um, China. We have faculty members from Africa. We have faculty members from Brazil um, and African-Americans. Um, so it's very difficult for a faculty member to um, teach diversity and inclusion uh, in their respective curriculum. Um, for example, if you're talking about um, marketing, uh, certainly diversity and inclusion needs to be infused in that, in that curriculum. Um, you know, marketing and advertising, uh, when you look at, um, you know, representing the community and, and all um, uh, aspects um, or all, all of the individuals um, uh, that you're trying to sell to um, and you're trying to send a message to, um, surely, you know, advertising needs to have a, a diverse, diversity and inclusion type focus. But if you have a faculty member who is not um, from this country and they're trying to uh, teach um, those diversity and inclusion concepts, uh, it may be very difficult for them. It may not be uh, adverse to it, but they just may struggle with that. So we're, we're gonna have to intentionally uh, provide those types of workshops and sessions to our faculty um, because I'm, I'm not of the mindset that you take one diversity and inclusion course and all students take it and you have a diversity, equity and inclusion professor and, and then you know, we're done with it. But um, diversity, equity and inclusion is, is, should really be infiltrated throughout all uh, or many uh, of the courses, um, you take uh, banking and finance, um, there, there's a history of um, uh, racism. Uh, there is a, a history of uh, economic injustice associated with it. There's a sociology um, um, that is tied to um, the banking or, or the effects of the banking industry um, and its um, uh, racism uh, you know, in certain communities. So to, to properly teach diversity, equity, and inclusion for today, you have to understand the, the history and, and the sociology. Well, you're really talking about another degree program <laughs> for, for professors. Um, to embark on. But I think that as more and more textbooks are, are being written, uh, they will begin to include those, those concepts. Um, you know, if you look at ethics a while ago, uh, Dean Jackford, I don't know if you remember, but ethics was a big, it was a hot topic that's 15 or, or maybe even more years ago. And then the question was, okay, do we have one ethics course or do we Kind of infuse ethics throughout the curriculum, um, and uh, many of the textbooks now uh, in the various disciplines have uh, ethics um, within them. In, in accounting, you have you certainly have ethics there. Uh, in information systems, you have ethics associated with uh, the safekeeping of of data. Uh, so 
you, you do have, um, or we have an opportunity to uh, bridge that gap between the faculties, uh, the faculty, um, faculty's lack of knowledge and the curriculum that desperately needs um, the infusion of diversity, equity, and, and inclusion um, uh, information. Thank you, Dean Nelson, for that answer. I just really thought it was insightful how you just included the sociology, sociology and like historical aspects of diversity and inclusion. I think that's really important to rem remember. We have five minutes left of this session, but I do want to ask Dean Shackelford because there have been a couple questions, a follow-up question on the last question. And they would like to know, do you have any tangible plans to increase the diversity and retention among faculty at Kenan Flagler? And will there be a more a higher emphasis on hiring diverse faculty when the business school expands? Absolutely. Um, we um, <clears throat> last year we only hired one faculty member in the school. It was a diverse uh, faculty member. Uh, this year it's been a major emphasis of our hiring, and it will be as long as I can imagine. So uh, that is a major focus of our our expansion. As I said, if you look at it as a percentage, uh, our diverse uh, faculty growth has been very strong. It's just we start from a small base. I, I do want to add on to something that uh, Dean Nelson said, because I thought his answer a moment ago was very thought provoking. Um, you know, by 2030, we, we estimate that the majority of our, fac our full time faculty will not have been born in the United States. So we have a highly diverse faculty, if you think about from a global perspective. And some of these issues that we think about as Americans in racial matters are a real struggle for people who haven't grown up in the US to understand. Um, and they have their own, you know, racial issues exist everywhere on the planet. So those are things that are challenges. challenges. Um, and, uh, and I thought another point you made that I wanna really second is just the, uh, uh, Faculty are not trained to tackle some of these issues, which makes it is a challenge for them. Uh, our faculty are growing into that, but it's a challenge, whatever your background. Um, but absolutely, we will have, we already have a much more diverse faculty than we did um, a few years ago, and we'll have a far more diverse faculty going forward. Thank you for that. Let's see if we can squeeze one more question in. We have three minutes. This one is for Dean Nelson. Someone just wanted more uh, clarification on why you felt that faculty from other countries may not be able to address diversity and inclusion in the courses within Central. Like, they, I guess they're just confused on why you think they won't be able to really understand and teach diversity because they're not from this country. Oh, well, good question. I'm glad, I'm glad they followed up with that because I certainly didn't want to um, make it appear as if I was saying that a faculty member from Africa or Brazil uh, could not teach diversity, equity, and inclusion um, within um, uh, the curriculum. Uh, I believe that they can, but I, I, if, if you ask me to uh, talk about, um, let's say I go over to, to Korea and, and I've been to Korea, but if they asked me to, to teach diversity, equity, and inclusion from a Korean type, Korean Japanese type of perspective where you know, the Japanese uh, once um, enslaved um, uh, and took advantage of, of the Koreans, I would not be, I would struggle to do that. I could learn and I, I, I could eventually do it, uh, but that wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't come to me naturally. And that's what I was trying to say that uh, individuals um, from Africa definitely have their uh, background um, that, that they have been faced with um, uh, in Africa, uh, but to teach it, to teach diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, as we face it here in, in America uh, would be probably a little more challenging for them. So I'm just saying that we need to uh, provide 
our faculty with the tools, no matter who they are, um, with the tools um, that they need in order to deliver the content in an effective way and an impactful way so that students will be successful. Um, even African-American um, African -American faculty members um, need assistance in this, this area. Uh, so again, I, I do not want you to believe that um, or, or to think that I um, was saying that someone from um, uh, outside of the United States cannot teach it. I, I would just say that all faculty need to be um, uh, trained in this area so that they can be more impactful. Thank you for clarifying that question. I just wanted to thank everyone who posed a question for us to ask, but unfortunately we can't get to all of them. Um, thank you, deans, for taking your time out of the day to talk to us. Thank you for so, these answers were just so insightful. And that is the end of this session.